All right, this one is going to be a lot more positive <laughs> and a lot more up my avenue because every single day I try to do better at what I'm shooting for, or aiming for. I'm using gun puns after I just got through making a video about guns. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. What I... I'm striving to do in my new career outside of uh, the music industry now that I've uh, been able to, uh, you know, secure some, you know, several commercials on YouTube and a feature film. And you know what? If there's haters out there who say I mentioned this, that's okay. I don't. The haters or trolls or online bullying it doesn't bother me none. The only words that should have effect on people are the words of those that you love and care for. You know, one thing that bothers me is when I hear some, you know, random person meeting a celebrity like, Oh my God, this is the greatest day of my life. No, the greatest day of your life should be every moment you spend with those who actually love you instead of those who are going to forget you in about 24 hours or less. So, I don't get it, but yeah, I'm not here to talk about that. Um, I find this acting coach to be one of the best, and I heard of him before. Um, of course, I live here in Colorado, and he lives elsewhere, but uh, he really breaks down um, some of the different acting techniques by some of the different actors, and each and every one of them are... are just yeah they're they're the ish but by the end of this i will at least give you my opinion on who i think did the best um and yes i have seen all three of the movies of what we're about to look at here and um yeah my opinion it, it's always going to stay the same because it to me has had more of an impact on not only uh, the culture of those who, you know, go to Comic-Con or go to, you know, these events where, you know, it's inspired to dress up, you know, to cosplay and all that. Like, he did a, an amazing job, and that's not taken away from the others that also did a great job. So uh, without further ado, um, like I said, when I mentioned about me starring in my first feature film. I had said this before and I'll say it again. I could be in a room with 30,000 people and not one other person could possibly say that. Does it make me wealthy beyond belief? Absolutely not. That's why you hear struggling actors. You do know Katy Perry after she came out with I Kissed a Girl that what I don't know where it hit on the billboards, but you know she was couch surfing at different friends' houses. You know, because you act in one, two, three, four movies doesn't mean that all of a sudden, like, wow, you're driving a Ferrari, you know, you are got yourself a $2 million, you know, suite on top of one of the, you know, most lavishest places in New York or L.A. I mean, no, you, I mean, you're not making much for these feature films until you start establishing, establishing yourself as you know, that go-to person, and once that happens, yes, then you're making some, some change, but, you know, I got paid pretty well for only 45 minutes of work, maybe? Now, if I got paid that much <laughs> per hour at a one, you know, at a nine-to-five, I'd be making, I'd be, yeah, bringing in a shit ton of money, Walter White money, probably not that much, but um, yeah, so when I mention that, it's because I'm proud. It's a proud moment for me. Something that I never thought or even dreamed of after I made my first. I always tell people like this. What is your dream to become in life? People will usually snap right to it. To do this, to do that, to become this. When you do that, what's your backup dream? nobody really has a backup dream this I fell into by accident 
because I had the experience from getting to go to classes when I was younger. And so, with that being said, let's see what other people think and feel when they critique these actors and somebody who has the right to do so because he is a hell of a good acting coach. <laughs> there wasn't one moment in this story where I did not believe Joaquin Phoenix had real pain. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Anthony Gilardi. I am an acting coach in Los Angeles, California. I am also a big Batman fan. And today we will be discussing Batman villains, what worked and what simply did not work. Among the criteria that we're gonna be looking for today is a solid motive, the origin, the backstory of the character, the, the humanity of the character, the mannerisms. You know, what I, I was just gonna say, Colin Murphy is so underrated. My God, that dude could act his ass off. And uh, for those of you who don't know who that is, that's that was the guy who portrayed the Scarecrow. That dude is a phenomenal fucking actor. I call Stick. Okay, let's go. What is she? There's this new law where if you're a bad enough bad guy, they stamp terrorist on your jacket. This is an exposition scene which means that the main character, in this case, Joker, in this moment, needs to be listening. They send you to this swamp in Louisiana, the black site. I feel that Leto got so caught up with being the Joker, he forgot the simple techniques of what is my objective? What do I need? That is the humanity of every character in every scene. And right here, I just saw a performance that is rudderless and it could have been solved by simply listening instead of external behavior in this moment i can tell you meant that yeah. he just didn't make any clear decisions am i going to be crazy in a menacing way am i going to be crazy in a playful way it just seems like he's altering his voice too much and trying different things The indecisiveness of Leto's voice here seems more like it's being worked out in front of us, but his audience shouldn't be involved in that process. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna kill me, Mr. J? What? I don't even believe that she is even scared in this moment. They are in two different moments. I'm not gonna kill you. I'm just gonna hurt you, really really bad and this is the birth of this relationship a dr frankenstein type of moment where dr frankenstein is creating in his mind a perfect human being to be his companion this moment should have been in that kind of vein instead of a menacing diabolical moment are you sweet talking me I know about your experiments with the inmates of your nut house. Colin Murphy, yeah, if you know the comics, the badass. origin of the Scarecrow, then this is a common trait for Batman villains. When they were younger, they were bullied, and they literally created a monster. But Killian does a great job of creating the buttons Excuse and the me. triggers, and you could see it with his reactions. I own the muscle in this town. Now. His body really doesn't move that much. But his eyes change, his breathing patterns change. As soon as he hears, I own the muscle of this town. Don't forget now, the muscle of this town is what bullied me and what created who I am today. And he knows there's only one thing left to do. Would you like to see my mask? Pay attention to the childlike manner that he says it in. Probably not very frightening to a guy like you. He's here. Who? The Batman. The cadence to his voice has changed. He is in a comfortable environment. What do we do? What anyone does when a prowler comes around. Call the police. He knows that this is his turf. He's having fun. So we could just see, even though he's not wearing the scarecrow mask, we could see that he right now is the scarecrow. But the Batman. As a talent for disruption. 
he's m almost like mocking him by saying the Batman that way. The Batman. He doesn't seem scared. He's inviting him into his domain. What have you been doing here? <laughs> so now you have Batman using his scarecrow poison against him. And at some point, you could actually see him just letting go and giving in. His eyes stop bulging so much. His breathing Hell changes. Dr. Green isn't here right now. This is a man that has mastered the art of fear. At his most fearful moment, he accepts it because fear is part of his identity. Again, another beautiful moment where he uses his eyes to tell the story. But if you'd like to make an appointment. This is Batman, Catwoman. Oh. <laughs> Speak of the angel. And I know it was the 1960s. This show was designed to be campy and for kids. What she did with the genre that she was working with was genius. She's using very simple but effective stick. Her mannerisms, everything she does with her fingers. The turgid twosome arrive here to rescue their precious ally Batgirl. When she's explaining to her henchmen her evil plot which she's very passionate about. Her embodiment of Catwoman is coming out in her speech. Batman has been invited by Queen Bess for a private audience at three o'clock. The way she's using her S's and her P's and her R's. Queen Bess, private audience, perfectly foolproof. It's perfectly, I, of course I can't do it, but she does it brilliantly here. We who enforce the law would gladly lay down our lives for it. She's squinting her eyes, to make them look more cat-like, and then she is opening her eyes when she listens to Batgirl say something that she just doesn't like. It shows that she is listening. It shows her passion. It seems like she believes that she is Catwoman. I'll try to pull the wool over our eyes. No, would I do a thing like that? <laughs> I am nature's arm. Her spirit. If I am born as Poison Ivy, I have to do very little to make sure that I show the world who I am. I just don't feel like you need to break stuff and use your voice and raise your arms to show that you are empowered. It should come from within. Her will. Help. I am Mother Nature. Now I know that in this story, everybody is going big. And they kind of wanted it to be like a, a campy version of Batman, much like the TV series. Now, if you're going to make a choice that I'm going to destroy this place, you're either going to go big or you're not going to go big. You can't half-heartedly break things. Your audience is going to question, why are you breaking things? If you have a purpose and you execute, then we won't even ask that question. Sorry. My vines have a crush on you. Catchphrase. It's forced in. Now, that's not the actor's fault that those are the lines in the script. <laughs> Gotta go. So many people to kill. So little time. But you either believe what you're saying or you don't believe. I f that's what I was about to say. So... A script can make or break you, because look at how badass she is in Kill Bill. Nothing seems forced. Nothing seems hyperbolic like she is being Poison Ivy. And, you know, as a newbie to the industry, I am not going to risk a potential career by putting in my own lines just for the sake of being more comfortable. No, I am going to read it as, you know, as written. Because once you start making those decisions that you're going to do it your way or when you feel that you could have done better, it should never, ever, 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 any inspiring actor out there that watches this, you should never, ever, ever cut or say cut, that's not your position. That is the director's decision, okay? 
Now, maybe if, yes, you've seen behind the scene bloopers of, you know, Avengers, you know, yes, if you're a Robert Downey Jr. or whatever, that's a different story. But when you're starting off, if you, you know, fuck up a line or something, usually line, somebody will remind you, okay, that's edible. They, not edible, <laughs> I should say different. That is something that they could do in post-production is edit that out. Make it to where it's supposed to sound as if it were written. I guarantee you if they didn't go with the campiness that they did for this, she would have killed the character. Um, that's why I think like with Christopher Nolan picking the, the, um, the villains that he did were more based on possible individuals who had I mean more realistic all the way around a sociopath like the Joker you know a, a thief a robber like Catwoman you know a Bane who you know that's probably like the the, the stretch of the character more than anyone who's, you know, wearing this mask that helps him control whatever, you know, he had went through. And I know it was what pain because he guarded the little girl who was Ra's al Ghul's daughter. Uh, I don't know, like, I, I don't know the backstory too much of that, but I'm just saying, you know, Uma Thurman kills it in Kill Bill, but here it's just like, Everything seems so dramatic. I feel with Uma Thurman's skills and talent, she could have made even a, a, a cheesy line sound real and cool. You're about to become compost. Yeah. I understand that the action sequences are not the actor's fault, but the behavior of being in battle is on the actor. I don't see any kind of confidence, danger, pain. I just don't believe that these two characters are in battle. Curses! No! You can call me Joker. The reveal is very important. Jack understands that his character has to go big here. And while he's taking off his hat, he has his eyebrows raised, his eyes widening very much like Eartha Kitt did in Catwoman, but this one's a little bit more maniacal. And as you can see, I'm a lot happier. <laughs> in this moment, he's letting his facial expressions do the acting for him. Jack is a genius at that. He's known for that. It's perfect casting. <laughs> when you have defeated somebody that has been keeping you down, you celebrate and Jack celebrates here. But the thing that I love about what he's bringing here is the liberating madness. And that's something that was never in the TV shows. This is something that, believe it or not, adds humanity to the character. We all wish that we could just go mad and say and do whatever we want. This Joker sets the bar for anybody that wants to play Joker from this point on. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? What? Every time I put this on, somebody dies. And? She's using her character shtick. A lot of the mannerisms that we saw with Jack Nicholson, a lot of the mannerisms that we saw with Eartha Kitt, but she's using them as a tool just like they did. Something tells me a whole lot of people are about to die. The way she's like chewing and snapping her gum, the way she says the word die. Die as if it's like a good thing in her world. Everybody else around her, the word die is a good thing in their world too. It is established that Harley Quinn has allies and you could tell that she's going to have fun working with her allies. The character needs to be unique. So her entrances and her exits need to be specific. Now she kicks these monsters' butts and she does it in a very, very cool way. Handles her business. Her exit has to be just as powerful. Hey guys, I'm 
guys. Come on, let's go. And that's it. The anti-catchphrase, it really caters towards the genre. It's called the mislead. By her being casual about it, it's a power move. This moment defines her as a powerful character, even more than when she destroyed her enemies. Love your perfume. What is that? The scent of death? Tragic irony or poetic justice. If you are a purist like I am uh, with the comics, the Penguin character is a very internal, emotional character. And Danny plays Penguin too much of a monster. This is all just a bad dream. You're at home in bed. He is using the attention to detail that we saw a lot of the other villains use, emphasizing certain words. And in this case, he's emphasizing like the P sounds and the B sounds. What you put in your toilet, I place on my mantle. Ah, you big baby. But he's doing it in a way that his objective is not human. He's, he's saying it so he, just so he could spit out the, the green slobber and make him look more menacing and more like a monster. I think this image says it all. At least give them a noble death and a respectful death. As Penguin is dying and he's approaching our hero, I never for one second felt like Batman was in real danger. I'm ready. They wanted this gothic death, but because it just looks ridiculous in so many ways, it turned more comical. And Danny runs with it. I think that he could have maintained a lot more humanity. My babies! Ah! <laughs> there wasn't one moment in this story where I did not believe Joaquin Phoenix had real pain. The external mannerisms all come from a visceral place. The way he looks down and up in, in that uncertainty, that laugh, I get that it's coming from an involuntary place from his gut, and it's so much more powerful that way. I take my hat off to Todd Phillips, the director. Phillips understood that if I just let Joaquin do his thing, he could improvise a beautiful moment by using his body. You see, he comes in. It's almost like a caterpillar coming into a cocoon. His posture is bad. His muscles are tense. He starts to metamorphosize. His gait slows down. His posture gets a little bit better. He lets go. He's able to look at himself in the mirror for the first time and see his true self. And you could just see that he just marvels at the results and he could take up as much space as he wants. Yes, you could call it madness, but you could see that it is liberating him. And I'll tell you this, not everyone is awful. But you're awful, Murray. Me? He does have a gun on him, but you get the sense that he's not quite sure yet how this moment is going to turn out. So he's listening and his eyes are telling the story about how he's processing what he's hearing. I'm awful? Oh yeah, how am I awful? Playing my video. And at this point, the voice is very childlike. He's whispering. Now, a huge piece of the puzzle with this Joker is not knowing who his father is. And you could tell that he has latched on to Murray as a male figure, even though he only saw him on TV. In his eyes, you could see the disappointment that could only be described as a son being disappointed in his father. It was so clear where his day-to-day -day pain lied. Yeah, but you know, truth be told, he did the same thing with Gladiator, with the disappointment in his father naming uh, Maximus his, uh, what do you call it, Maximus to take over the, you know, the title as Caesar or Emperor, you know, of Rome. And he played that same look and disappointment in his eyes of a fatherly role model as he is doing here. So 
Yeah, I mean, fucking Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, he has range like none other. Like I had mentioned, and I will always stand by my words on this. Tom Cruise, have you ever, and really, look at every single movie he's ever made. Have you ever seen a movie with Tom Cruise where he doesn't sound the same? Like, he has absolutely no range to play... I mean, once you hear his voice or you see him, you know it's him. That's that. But, like, with somebody like Joaquin Phoenix, like, you could have fooled me because I would have thought, man, this dude is an ascendant of freaking, you know, Romans, the way he freaking, you know, ancient Romans, the way he, you know, could manipulate his voice. The same with Russell Crowe, the same with, you know, Heath Ledger, the same with a lot of these actors that have range... To me, Tom Cruise, you know it's Tom Cruise when he makes a movie. You know it's him. Not to say that he's a bad actor, but really, he sounds the same in Top Gun as he does in Mission Impossible. Just my opinion. He's got us, like, hook, line, and sinker from the very beginning. Isn't it beautiful? Are you yesterday's news, Bruce? Yes, yes, yes. Bruce, old man. We need to see the evolution of Edward Nigma here. Before Edward Nigma becomes Riddler, I could see that kind of behavior when he's around Bruce Wayne. But in this moment, we need to see the change. He's still behaving the way he used to behave. He's still insecure and doesn't have the confidence that he has gained through his transformation. The press were just wondering what it feels like to be outsold, outclassed, outquaffed. Now, I like what he's motivated by. I see a man that is motivated by envy and pride. He's trying to emulate Bruce Wayne. But if you're trying to emulate somebody, then emulate them and prove to them how far you have come. So your face needs to be a lot more still. Now, I know that Jim Carrey is a very animated actor to begin with. That's why I think we're seeing too much Jim Carrey. And just by relaxing his face, it would have added the humanity to the moment and told the story better. And become Gotham's cleverest carbon... Could you imagine how close we were to Tim Burton fucking up comic book movies, never having the Avengers, never having... Iron Man never having any of those movies because of this kind of crap he was putting out. I mean, I still can't bring myself to watch A Nightmare Before Christmas. And, I mean, single-handedly, he almost effed up the genre that rules the box offices now. Based life form! Your voice, your facial tics, your mannerisms, your body language should tell the story without it being too theatrical. You could put your unique stamp on it without going too big. Who is Batman? (laughs) The attention to detail, even down to the laugh, is not one note. He starts to laugh and then he starts to grunt My absolute favorite portrayal of this character, Heath Ledger. If you guys remember, there was so much backlash against him being casted as the Joker. Everybody was like, all this dude has done is like, you know, these teeny movies, these, you know, rom-coms. You know, why would they even pick him as a Joker? Nobody knew which direction Christopher Nolan was going to go with this. He made it the most realistic of a Batman, you know, movie than ever before of a vigilante movie than any other film before it to where it was plausible that this dude is a sociopath, psychopath. God only knows how many (laughs) freaking, uh, you know, mental disturbances are going on in his head, you know, as a character. Um, 
and the way Chris Nolan approached that was just beautifully. And the way Heath Ledger took it, especially with so much backlash from fans, like, oh, that's bullshit. Why would they, you know, cast him for the Joker? Well, it shut them all the hell up. Aha. Almost like he's mocking human laughter. I thought my jokes were bad. Christopher Nolan, the director of this film, he said that Heath Ledger really idolizes ventriloquists and, and how creepy the ventriloquist dummy really is. And, and how. Now, you guys know he's a U.S. senator. Oh, I'm pointing and you guys don't even know him. He's a U.S. senator and a big time lover of comic books. So he's been in almost every single DC movie from, uh, like, uh, in uh, Batman vs. Superman. He's sitting on the council with uh, Holly Hunter. You know, she's the, she's the forefront. And he's, uh, he's sitting there uh, along with her. You'll always see a cameo of him in DC movies because he was really a huge fan of DC. And so I think that's really cool that I hear this, you know, older Senator, you know, still shows this playful side of, you know, appearing in DC movies. Now he has never done that with Marvel. So he was a huge DC fan. Creepy. The ventriloquist dummy really is the way that it is mechanical and, and almost being like manipulated by a higher power. And you could see that he incorporated a lot of those mannerisms into the character just by the way he walks just by the noises and the sounds that come out of his mouth we are tonight's entertainment the way he moves around his eyes the way he moves his mouth and his jaw you remind me of my father i hate my father his actions make you think that he's making up these stories as he goes but he does a really good job of using his voice in a very powerful way, almost like a musical instrument. He changes his pitch and he changes his cadence. It has an unpredictable effect. Well, hello, beautiful. And you are beautiful. Well, you look nervous. This Joker is very rough around the edges and not polished. If we go back and watch that walk, his head is tilted, his spine is tilted. Even his posture is chaotic. And when it comes down to his plot, he doesn't want money. He just wants chaos. The subtle mannerisms like the licking of his lips that calls attention to the origin of the Joker. He's telling the person that he's speaking to, I'm going to give you permission to look at my scars. Don't look away because he knows that that is the core of his origin. You? This right here is a clinic on storytelling. Joker is Batman's nemesis. You have to learn something from your nemesis. And that is what we see right here. Watch the, the excitement in Heath Ledger's eyes. No, you, you complete me. Same thing with his body language. He's leaning in. He really wants to get food to Batman. You're garbage. Don't talk like one of them, you're not. To them, you're just a freak. He's actually using inflection to add different subtext. See, they're morals, they're code. When he says they're code, he creates subtext, what he really means and how he really feels about these things. He very clearly is saying, you're not talking to one of these thugs that you put in Archive Asylum. You're talking to me. This moment pretty much sums up everything that we talk about. See, I'm not a monster. I'm just ahead of the curve. Meow. Yeah. This is a very good Catwoman reveal. She looks at Penguin and Batman almost like in a disappointing way. That disappointing look along with the way she delivers the line meow kind of makes it look like she's better than them. She's cooler than them. She doesn't even belong here. These are the people that I'm going to fight. And she really tells that story in one word. Meow. Still alive! Now I understand that she's getting shot. I think that... She should have stood up. 
used her voice, got her power back. I don't like the, the, the waddle towards him. <laughs> the laugh just could have been done in a more powerful way. We see too much pleading and begging in her eyes. Don't forget, Catwoman is going to persevere through this. Resilient like a cat. And I don't see that in this moment. In her voice, in her eyes, in her tone, and in her posture. We saw too much Selena Kyle and not enough Catwoman. A lot of the blame has to go to the storyteller themselves. In this case, Tim Burton. I feel that it would be more powerful for her to rise up in this moment than to make it look like she's collapsing within. How about a kiss, Santa Claus? think darkness is your ally. You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it. You know, you hear stories about how he bulked up and to be honest, anybody could do that. What separates the good actors from the great actors are the way they use their body. Now watch the way he's walking around. Look at his posture. This body language tells us he feels comfortable here. He's been in the darkness his entire life. He even turns his back a few times on Batman. It's a very cool way to deliver exposition and show the origin of his character. I didn't see the light until I was already a man. By then it was nothing to me but blind. And that eruption right there. It's a brilliant move by Tom Hardy. I'm in charge. Do you feel in charge? He didn't come over to him and put his hand on his shoulder in a very menacing way, squeezing his shoulder. He's just, and, and actually a very, very delicate, almost nurturing manner. And his hand looks like it's almost gonna caress his face. And you can put yourself in the other guy's shoes. It's like, what is happening? Is he gonna kill me? Is he gonna kiss me? It just sucks you in. Get him! Take control. If you really listen closely to Bane's voice, there's a lot of moments where it looks like, like he's out of breath and he's catching his breath. Now we come here not as conquerors, but at the first sign of interference from the outside world. Now Tom Hardy incorporated that into his character because he wanted to show his pain. It shows a lot of humanity, and it shows his origin, and he does it without explaining it. He does it through the subtleties of his actions. That's a lovely, lovely voyage. There are so many Batman villains. We can't get to all of them, but I want to give some shout outs. I want to give a special honorable mention shout out to Burgess Meredith. As the Penguin in the TV show, Mark Hamill plays the voice of Joker in the animated series, Liam Neeson. For Ra's al Ghul, I think he did a great job. I also want to give a very dishonorable mention to Uma Thurman's henchman, Bane. Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze. Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face did not work. All great actors, too. And that was the sad part, is that, to me, Tim Burton's over-the-top crap. Oh, like, could have just completely messed up so many films. But... What do I know? I'm just starting off, and he directed, and they they trust him to direct. And like I said, I still haven't seen Nightmare Before Christmas, so hey. Um, yeah, he probably has some hidden gems there that I need to check out. But yeah, I thought this was a tad bit interesting. Thought I'd share it. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. Um, if you like the content and anything I have to say or... Uh, just content in general feel free to like and subscribe it's still so odd for me to say that but um, yeah I'm enjoying YouTube and YouTubing that's a word um, so yeah I would appreciate it thank you guys very much and I'll probably be back with something a little bit smaller but until then you guys have a wonderful night peace